Sometimes I think about joining the military. Stand up. That was what Andrew said to me one evening in the winter of 2007, when he was 24 and I was 23. I would leave you, I said. But she didn't. Her husband Andrew's drive to join the Special Forces Unit in the military took precedent over her nascent career in publishing. That was the first compromise, but not the last, as Simone Garindo lived her new role as a military wife, and their marriage partnership was tested. When you're called to serve the nation, to wear the cloth of our great nation, it is, in fact, uh, an honor. But it does not come cheap, and it, it, it must be earned every day. And, uh, you know, if you're going to bring everybody with you, make sure you, you finish with them all, too. Wives play an important role in military service. In her book, The Wives, Garindo gives readers a peek behind the curtain of military life, the challenges deployed family members face, and the strength of the community of wives that the general public may not consider. Please welcome Simone Garindo to the Northwest Passages stage. Thank you for coming. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Oh, I gosh. I forgot to say I'm Christy Burns, in case those of you don't know me. And I get to put together events at Northwest Passages. And as I said uh, when I was introducing the video, from the moment I saw that you had written this book, in fact, I think I was stalking her. I sent her, she has, a, she has her own website, so you're allowed, right? So I sent an immediate request. Hey, when this book comes out, can you please come to Spokane? I really, really <laughs> want to talk to you because I think that uh, as a culture, perhaps, society today doesn't really know what military spouses go through, military wives, uh, you know, and I can count, and I live, we all are right here next to Fairchild Air Force Base and everybody's experience is different. I know maybe two people, three, I just thought of a third. Mary Beth is actually a military wife. Hmm. So I think that it's a really important topic and I was, excited to read your memoir and is that why you is, is the lead up as to is that why you is that why you wrote it is that was that a motivating factor for you to put out a memoir at the ripe old age of oh I don't know 39 39, yes, 39. let's write a memoir at 39 <laughs> I know it's a little presumptuous to write a memoir at 39 but it's really just a sliver of my experience and yes that was definitely a motivation I did not think I was ever going to write a memoir about uh, this experience because, well, there are a lot of privacy issues. Yeah, secrets. There are a lot of, uh, you know, operational security things to navigate. And really, there's a lot of messaging that we're given as spouses um, to be silent. And that's a really uh, huge part of kind of our role as it were um, and you know not to let on when our husbands are leaving or where they're going or what they do for a living or when they're coming home and um, that, that can be incredibly isolating and it, and it can contribute to what you're talking about which is really the military civilian divide yeah. and um, you know the, after the book now has come out I have talked to a lot of people who say I, I know several military spouses but I really knew nothing about what it was like. And I think it's so much because that kind of, that silence that is assigned to us for good reason in many ways, but um, contributes to that. So I think when I did actually start to write the book, it was because I had written a bunch of essays over, over the years that had been, you know, had been published in different outlets. And there was one I published in the New York Times that was really about uh, the women I became close to in Georgia. I had moved to Washington with a new baby. I was alone a lot. You know, my husband was gone quite a bit, and I missed them. And I also newly understood and appreciated what it was like to do this life raising kids because mm -hmm. I had not not done that in my years in okay. Georgia. You're, you're jumping jumping them ahead. I, I want to talk okay. a little bit about your love story or a little <laughs> bit about that whole or the, okay. the, the, the but that first is the part. reason yeah. was really that I yeah. people were saying these women are so strong and terrific and I I want to learn. I mean yeah. I just they were just fascinated and 
amazed and, and were saying this is not a story I'd heard. And so that was really, yeah. I think, what motivated me ultimately. One of the things that I was uh, drawn to is how you described yourself as a pacifist mm -hmm. uh, during the early stages of your relationship with Andrew. Um, Gosh, I mean, they even wrote letters. So many. It's a very romantic story. I have a couple of little things flagged up there, mm. but you know, it's just uh, how you were very young when you moved to New York City, and you were there during 9-11. Mm. Uh, how did uh, your feelings about the military, um, what were they at, at that time? At the time that I moved to New York? Yeah, when you were in New York before, and 9-11, and... And being a pacifist. Yeah, so I moved to New York when I was 17, and I'd never been east of Nevada before then. And two weeks later, the Twin Towers fell. And I later marched against uh, the war in Iraq. And, um, you know, it was very, the loss was very real to me in the sense that our neighborhood was quarantined and, and, the buildings were just papered with the missing. Um, and I knew people who'd been in the building and the um, and survived. And my boss's mother had been in the building and survived. And so those losses were very real, but I did not jump to, um, you know, re the idea of retaliation mm -hmm. or the idea of, you know, uh, defense. And... That is really because I'd been raised in a household that um, was anti-military. I'd been raised on Vietnam protest songs. You know, my father would have done anything to get out of the draft. And um, it was not, it just wasn't a world that I knew much about. Yeah. I only knew it was, a, it was a world I didn't want to be a part of. Right. When he uh, said that he was going to be, um, it was, that he was going to enter the military and you said no I would leave you I mean mm -hmm. that was your initial gut reaction and then the first quote the quote in the book um should we sing moving down to that leave in <laughs> on the midnight train to <laughs> rather be in his world than alone without him in yours mm -hmm. that that ha that was what changed your mind about okay I can be a military wife I think what changed my mind was Two years went by after he said, sometimes I think about joining the military. And we got engaged, and it came back up. And it had not gone away, um, his desire. And we ended up going to couples counseling when we were engaged, which it was really to solve this unsolvable issue, but I kind of rec recommend it for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, in one of the early sessions, he said, if I, if I have to choose between you and the army, it's the army. And that hurt, but it also told me something because really since the beginning of our relationship, he'd been so sure about us. He had been so sure that I was the one. Yeah, you you met early on in high school. I mean, when I talk about this romance, it was... We met when we were kids, kids. and then reconnected, and, and really on our first real date, he said, I'm going to... He had a few too many drinks and said, I'm going to marry you. And I said, that wasn't you're high out school. of your mind. That was, that was later. <laughs> that was later. later. That was later. But... um. So I just realized that it was a conviction and maybe even a calling, and um, he was willing to give up me and us uh, to join. And so it was kind of, I just knowing that he felt that strongly about it, I couldn't, I didn't want to lose him. Yeah. So that's that's why I went along for the ride. Yeah, the bar <laughs> the bartering of a contract was there. You know, at one point it was all right. And what is a, the contract? Did I understand it correctly? Three years. That first one yeah. was, I think, three and a half years. Because he was in years. school. I mean, the the idea of of moving to Columbus, and maybe I'm getting ahead, but how uh, how do you how do you barter a contract? Or do is is that something that military spouses do? <laughs> barter contracts. <laughs> barter contracts. All right, we're going to yeah. do three years, Absolutely. and then we're out. In a or, way, yeah. I mean, so it's different for officers, but for en for enlisted men, it's. Um, you can do different length contracts. And usually the initial one tends to be shorter, but you can go for longer ones and you're getting bigger you know, bonuses essentially. I can't think of what they're actually called. They're not bonuses, yeah. but enlistment something or others um, for a longer contract. And they own you for the length of that yeah. contract. 
and it's not like you can quit. Um, you can, but then you owe the army a lot of money. Apparently, mm. is what is what I've been told. So it's pretty it's pretty intense, and you're signing away a lot of civil rights when you do that. Um, and it's it's a commitment wow. for sure. And so it's a um, it's every time reenlistment comes up, it's a kind of negotiation of how long are we going to do this? Is this going to be a twenty year career? That kind of thing. Can you tell uh, when uh, a, why when are there other wives that are going through it? It's like, okay, yeah, the 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 chatter, or, or if there's somebody that's coming in, it's like, oh yeah, they're only going to last one contract, or oh no, that's a lifer. Is there that is, or is that a stereotype? I think it's a it's impossible to say. I mean, in the book, you know, there's a scene in which we are talking about reenlistment, and it's not something. I'm trying to think of the right words. I had seen a lot of spouses say, that's not us. We're not doing 20 years. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, some people are made for this. It's not me. We're getting out. And you see a lot of the guys because they're, it's so intense. The operation tempo is so intense. They're really going back and forth at a breakneck pace. And so you also see them go week to week. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Done with this. To, you know, signing a seven year contract. <laughs> and, and it's really, I mean, it, it, you are on a roller coaster of emotions. So people say all kinds of things. And I thought, you know, that when I would see spouses go from we're not going to do this to saying, yes, let's do another enlistment, that they were just kind of acquiescing. Mm -hmm. And I think on some level that's that's true. On another level, though, I think that it's like anything else. You know, the way they say it in his unit is uh, he grew up in the unit. Mm -hmm. And I think it's you grow up somewhere, it's hard, the idea of leaving that that comfortable place, even if that place is very challenging, mm -hmm. is really terrifying. And who wants to grow up again? Which is essentially what going out into civilian life feels like. Yeah. And you watch a lot, I mean, I see a lot of guys get out, and Andrew sees a lot of them because they come back as contractors. So he'll see them, you know, when he's training. And they're just like, they miss it. They're like, there's nothing like it. I wish I was still in. You know, it's so it's a, it's such like a push and pull of I want to get out. I want to stay in. And I think that the spouses go through that, too, because it's such a tight knit world that you become a part of. Well, that tight knit world uh, in Columbus, Georgia, which is not nearly as rural as some people would think, as you were telling me <laughs> earlier. Right. Uh, but uh, what's the difference, or between uh, Columbus uh, being there and you are still married, and your husband is still with the military, and now you're mm -hmm. in Tacoma? Mm -hmm. What are there similarities, or are there differences? Is it different now that you are uh, more experienced mm -hmm. as a wife uh, in the Tacoma world versus the uh, Columbus world? It is really different in part, I think, of my own choosing. You know, we've been in Tacoma for seven years. And Columbus, Georgia, I had a wonderful support network of people who were, you know, tied to his unit. And, and that was great, but it was also my entire world, uh, which was really insular. And when I got to Washington, I really wanted to diversify. <laughs> And broaden. And I really, you know, I had come from New York City where I was working as an editor. And that was, you know, a big part of my identity and moved to Georgia where I just my whole identity really for for quite some time was I was a wife uh, within that world. And so I think that was part of why I wanted to experience um worlds outside of that one. And so in Tacoma, we decided, you know, we decided not to live by the base, but a freeway right away. Um, and we decided to, you know, have our kids not like in base schools, but in the city. And it's, you know, I know people from his unit, but I also have a huge community of people who are, are not connected to it. I would say the thing that I really brought from my time in Georgia, though, is I think People, we live in a real, we live in a very lonely time. Like we, it's been called this epidemic of loneliness. And I think people are really hungry for neighbors and villages and human connection. And I learned in Georgia to really intentionally build community mm -hmm. and how much work that takes, but how rewarding it is. And so I think I, I've taken that and 
done that in Tacoma and, and built a, like a, a place that really feels like home. And the idea of leaving it now is painful to think yeah. about. Uh, but possible, because the military go Completely, anywhere. yes. But uh, that segues very nicely into your relationship with Rachel, um, mm -hmm. who is introduced early in the book, who even taught you how to drive. You mentioned that you were in New <laughs> yes. York, and so that you never had to drive before you were in Georgia. Yeah. So thank God for Rachel for that. Uh, but I, I love the idea of what her husband and, and you, both of you guys as couples, you didn't, you didn't live on the base. I mean, mm -hmm. there must have been something in both of you to not live on the base, and as you mentioned, a, a very significant decision was then made in Tacoma as well. Hmm. Uh, but um, do you think you would have met Rachel if you lived on base? I mean, how different would your life be with the wives if you were part of the base compound? I think I would have known a lot more people in the, in the Army world that were not part of Andrew's unit, probably. Okay. But I think, you know, really the beauty of meeting Rachel was I met her the moment we showed up. And I mean, literally the moment we rolled up onto our driveway with our U-Haul and she just appeared on, the, on our driveway saying, can I help you with that? And came back two hours later with cookies. And she was as new as I was. You know, her husband was friends with my husband because they had gone through training together. And she'd been there maybe a week prior which is probably, she probably spent a very lonely week there, and that's probably why she was so eager when we arrived. And, um, you know, it, and then our husbands deployed two weeks later to Afghanistan, and so we went to the drop-off together and saw each other cry before we really knew anything about each other. And I don't know, I don't know that I would have had a bond like that because the person across the street on base would not be going through the exact same experience I was. And there's something unique. I made other friends along the way, good friends, but there was something unique about that friendship. And she remains one of my closest friends because we kind of came up in the ranks together mm -hmm. in, in the way that the guys do. And there's something irreplaceable about that and something um, that created, it's something about it that created very quick intimacy, very quick friendship, even though we were really different in a lot of ways. It's almost like I went to boarding school crying in front of somebody. And yeah, then you're like, totally. Yes. You know that you're going to yes. be buddies with them forever and ever because they've seen you at such a vulnerable <laughs> point. <laughs> exactly. And you have nothing and no one yeah. else. So no. you're just going to cling to each other. <laughs> well, when uh, uh, you talk about keeping secrets and you're writing as an editor and I guess as a journalist, I was like, how on earth is a journalist trained to keep a secret? And how do you then not ask questions? And so there was a, a lot of things that I that must have been so just the antithesis of, of well, it, it, there were moments where you were like fighting back. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you how do you do that? How did you do that? I was really bad at it. Yeah. I mean, I think that I <laughs> well, was... you didn't post on social media. I mean, I was good. I was good. Yeah. I was okay at that part. You know, mm -hmm. I was okay at the secret keeping part. And yet, I couldn't not write about the experience. It was impossible for me not to. And of course, I wanted to publish because I was a published writer. Yeah. And um, you know, I learned that I could. I remember the first piece I published was also in the New York Times. And Andrew went to his boss and said, can she do this? And he said, she's not in the Army. <laughs> she doesn't have access to you know, confidential information. And, and so I learned how to navigate that. Um, and it turns out I can publish quite a bit. He, he's the one who's truly handcuffed in that yeah. regard. Uh, but in terms of sharing information, it's, it's harder. I think the harder part is not being able to tell your own mother, my husband's deploying tomorrow. Not even something as basic as that. They couldn't. Not even something as basic. You might be yeah. able to say a deployment is coming up. But you can't say when. You can't say it's only after they're gone and really over after they're all the way over there, which can take for freaking ever. The anxiety um, that you gotta go through. And yeah, and you're just it's just very isolating. Yeah. And I do think that that's why I mean it just is fertile ground for really fast friendship with the other spouses because it's the only community in which you can feel really seen mm -hmm. at all. And then you know, even I mean, there are some deployments where you can't tell anybody during the whole duration, depending on the quality of the deployment. And you might, family knows, but you walk around your day, you know, 
having exchanges with people you see every day with them not really knowing what you're going through, what your kids are going through. Um, and that's and that's really complicated for for kids. I mean, that's a whole other level. Yeah, the 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 separation and the it's not a the word I'm looking for. Um, yeah, just having a missing parent. You're the person or the parent that's there is the parent that's you know, you do all the hard stuff. Yeah, and you want to tell them. There's so much they can't understand, but it also that changes as they age, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to give them like a shred of information mm -hmm. or truth or certainty because they may be children, but they're part of your family. Yeah. And um, it's really hard to figure out how to do that. And then, of course, you can't. You don't want to tell them, but don't talk about this at school to you know a seven-year-old. Yeah. It's that's too much for them to carry. Yeah. And so I've also just learned that you do your best, but I also you also learn to trust certain people, and you lean on those people and and their wives <laughs> yeah exactly and their wives exactly uh at one point uh andrew was returned and told you that what you've read in the media is not what actually happened and uh, that they get the wrong story more often than not ha, that's nuts <laughs> and, i love that reaction and i love yeah. that you pointed that out because that section was so important to yeah. me and I don't feel like anybody asks about it. And I'm, well, but it, it's because it. it is not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and there's a whole discussion of, of well, of what right. do you trust? And then, right. well, well, news media right now in this country is under a huge spotlight of, oh, we don't trust NPR anymore. You can't trust Fox News. But, uh, know. you know, to have unbiased journalism or journalists that are asking questions to get to the truth, and yet there's there's something that's happening and your husband is part of the military experience that's experienced something that we don't we don't know and then you find out about stuff and you have to keep your mouth shut and even then mm -hmm. it's sort of there's layers of understanding there there are things he even has as an adult forget about the kids right but i mean <laughs> yeah. even what information he has access to versus what a two-star general has access to versus i mean there's so many layers just within the unit and then within the larger military of really understanding and knowing what's going on. And then there's specific, you know, missions. And that's what that section was about, yeah. was we had gotten a letter from the battalion commander telling us this is what happened. And then I'd read, you know, something in the news saying this is what happened. And then Andrew's like, mm, I don't know if either things exactly happened, but he also wasn't there. So yeah. then it's sort of like he gets his own version of a briefing and the grapevine of information. And so really... It's sort of like whoever is on the ground probably knows what happened, but everyone else. But but what does that mean on the ground? Yeah. There's there. I mean, it's a complicated quote unquote like 360 degree battlefield, and people are having chaotic experiences if it, if it's a mission that went wrong, which is what yeah. this was. Um, and so and then you come in as a journalist, and even if you're a journalist who spent the last decade reporting on a conflict and knows way more than the public, you might be given very little access or information, and you're doing your best. So it is, I hope that that section read as, I trust journalists, yeah. I think they're doing an incredible job, but it's really hard to report on the yeah. military. The, uh, that, was, that did come through very loud and clear. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> very, very Stop. loud and clear. Um, and when you're talking about your own writing and writing what you know and how uh, Andrew's boss said, yeah, well, she's not in the military. She can write whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. I mean, she doesn't have access to all that stuff. Um, was your experience as an editor problematic for when you were writing? I mean, the New York Times um, articles that you've, you've written in a number of publications, the ones that I saw were all New York Times bylines, which is just super cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, military life, um, um, you know, perspectives and essays that you had done. But how, uh, how did being an editor affect how you were writing? Do you mean in terms of the craft of writing uh, or no limit, you... limiting yourself as far as as yeah uh, limiting yourself when you are writing something um did you edit too much out of your own oh, story I see what you're as to yeah, yeah um, okay no this isn't this this isn't important here i or, you know we gotta go put something else there yeah it's a challenge especially i'll just speak to writing the memoir because 
I feel like, you know, a memoir is not good unless it's very honest. Mm, well, yeah. <laughs> it needs to be very honest. And yet, you know, the, there are... I did not feel limited in terms of how much I knew, because I really don't know that much. But I am writing about a world where lots of secrets are kept, where silence is honored, where, you know, and it's a kind of, what's the right word? Break, uh, it's taboo to talk about some of the things I'm talking about in our marriages and in our friendships and the kind of messaging we're getting during briefings and all of that. It is not, it is openly talked about over wine, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's breaking rank a little bit to go out there and write it in a book. So I had to put that on a shelf and put it out of my mind when I sat down and wrote as much as humanly possible. But I, what I did keep with me were my the women mm -hmm. and my husband, really. And mostly the women, though. And every time I sat down to write, I thought about them. I mean, I felt like they were in the room with me. And I thought, how can I write something that will feel real and true to our collective experience and also honor them? Yeah. Um, which is complicated and hard. Because, I mean, you're, I'm writing about myself. And it's ultimately a self-portrait, as any memoir is. But it's also a collective portrait. And um, it felt like a kind of crazy thing to undertake and a responsibility <laughs> definitely well uh when you're talking about um the wives that formed your community that were part of your life uh did you find yourself rejecting stereotypes of military wives that uh as a military spouse you knew mm -hmm. um were not not true as most stereotypes may be but what was like a big stereo that well the most one when i was online hey you know, if you're going to be married to a military, this is a military spouse. This is advice we give. You know, you got to bring everybody back. You got to mm. be. Um, uh, th there, there's that adage. We can't do what we do unless it's because of you. I, I, did I mess that one up? It the, was. There is. A, it's funny. Well, so the old adage is, if we wanted you to have family, we would have issued you yeah, one. Yeah, you would have been. But yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> but then the messaging we really got in our unit was they can do what they do because of you, which was a kind of tribute to us, And but it was also a kind of lip service. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of saying, you know, you're holding down the fort, you're the gravitational force that allows them to keep going at this breakneck pace and do really hard things physically and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. Yeah. And that means keep it together, Yeah, basically. I mean, that was the underlying message of that was keep it together. So, gosh, the I think that were there stereotypes that you rejected that people were that as a military spouse automatically like, I don't have to keep this together because I'm your wife. This is just because this is what is said. This isn't part of our marriage. And that this will move into my next question about therapy, mm. <laughs> which I'm just. I think I resented at the time being a gravitational force. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know. I, you would like the world to re revolve around you, but not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not like that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't feel that, you know, I wanted to be in what felt like an equal partnership, partnership. which means that you are each other's gravitational force yeah. essentially. And he is a very reliable, enduring person like he has grit he will be there when you need him he has always been that kind of person and that is one reason I married him and yet he has so often not been there when I've needed him he has so often not been there when my children have needed him um and that's a really hard thing to reconcile yeah. and you know I think it's taken us 12 years now to really figure it out <laughs> it feels yeah. like we've just finally figured yeah. it out on balance it's still totally insane yeah but the uh, next question is, I really want to applaud you for recognizing therapy, your visits to couple therapy and writing about it. I can get behind, or I guess I understand the military stigma about it, but um, I would think that mental health would be a better, a bigger priority mm -hmm. for uh, those that are in the military. Was there any hesitation from Andrew or about putting that in the book? 
because it's such an important part of uh, marriage and the relationship. It's it's raw and it's real. And and mm -hmm. uh, even at one point, you talk about how you find a therapist that's not on the base that you don't mm -hmm. want to, you, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't. He doesn't want to be seen, and you make the appointment under your name. Mm -hmm. But he's at one point also says we need to go back to therapy. It's a good question, and I think that had this book been published. I don't know, six years ago, he would have had some serious hesitations, really about the whole book. Yeah. <laughs> but because it changes, he has changed, and it changes, I think, for any of the guys, the longer they're in. Mm -hmm. And I think his feeling at that time was he was, you know, a lower-ranking NCO, which is really... Uh, for the non-military person. Right, a non-commissioned... It's like Thank a sergeant. You. It's like the <laughs> most basic you know, uh, rank of sergeant. There's different ranks of sergeant beyond that. And, um, yeah, I don't think he wanted people to know then. But I think he is older now. He's much higher in rank. He's now, you know, some of his guys call him grandpa because he's 40, so he's very wow. old <laughs> to be in the unit. And um, it's, he doesn't care. I mean, yeah. he can kind of, he can be who he is. He can be his full self in a way that he couldn't then. I also think there has been more evolution in terms of at least lip service to the idea of therapy, especially couples therapy. I think going on your own to therapy, there is still a kind of taboo around it in his unit. But I think couples therapy less so. Um, and there's, I don't know all the reasons for that, but probably part of it is so, you know, we can keep that gravitational force yeah. together. <laughs> it's because they know that family is really important to these guys yeah. and that the divorce rate is really high and that you see marriages fall apart and then you see the guys fall apart after the marriage falls apart. Um, so, yeah, there are marriage retreats. And they talk, I mean, I've gone to one recently where the first sergeant, you know, talked pretty, pretty openly about going to couples counseling with his wife. So... I think it's becoming more and more of an accepted... Accepted and less, less of a I stigma. I think so, yeah. Do you hope that the book being published, The Wives, will inspire change? And in what way? Or, no, I don't want it to change, Christy. <laughs> oh, I, yes, no. I would love no. lots what, of change. What, what, what would mean, be like the first thing that you would hope The Wives brings attention to? I think the first thing I would like it to bring attention to is that spouses in some of these units, especially over the last 20 years, and I've known wives who've gone through 16 deployments and raised four kids and guys who've gone through 16 deployments, that there has been some recognition that um, certain units have kind of like carried these conflicts on their backs, but there hasn't been as much recognition that families have been carrying them as well. And that especially the children didn't ask for this. They yeah. didn't sign up for this. Um, so I think I'd like people to know that, just to see and witness what that's really like. And I would like the Army to give us more support. I mean, I think there's one of the reasons we grow so close as wives is because we don't have other supports yeah. a lot of the time. And we are asked to do kind of ridiculous and untenable things sometimes. Not all the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes. And you do them, and everyone's a superhero. You yeah. know? But yeah. it's sort of like we're not superheroes. So I would love, you know, more child care support. I would love to see, I mean, that's probably the main thing. I think thing. everybody wants more child care yeah. support. <laughs> I, I think everyone does. I think it should yeah. be more of a given yeah. in the military than it is. But other than that, I don't know. I, it's hard. Change is a lofty thing that I, I hope it inspires. But really, yes, I would just like that uh, human awareness of, of our experience. I actually would like the military to make the wives required reading. I understand. I, love, I mean, that would be great too. I think that that uh, <laughs> I, I understand that there is a protocol. I didn't. I became recently aware of, uh, at least in the Marines, that certain areas that you had to 
read, a, there's a book list of things that you read mm -hmm. at certain points. I, I didn't know that. Uh, and the wives, though, should definitely be on it. Uh, what advice would you give? I mean, this you should get. This actually be a great gift for a military spouse. Hey, look, this is what you could. <laughs> this is what you could build. Would it? <laughs> no, I, no. I think it would. I think it. I think the underlying there. There are two. There's you know your story about your marriage, but there's also the story about the wives and everybody that supports everybody yeah. through the military, and that that's a great community. Mm -hmm. I mean. You find community uh, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there were, there was some references to cliques and ranks and file of different kind of things, but mostly you found a lot of women on both sides of the fences and mm -hmm. different things that you thought. Uh, another thing that resonated with me and I was talking about with my kids was the idea of guns. I didn't have guns growing up in my house. Mm -hmm. And you write so magnificently about him your husband taking you to, to a range. I'm like, I ain't going to do that. And, you know, your experience of holding a gun and like, okay, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. But yet it's part of the military and it's part of the life. It was, that was a beautiful part of the book too. I oh, mean, thank you. Scary that and hard. That was hard to write yeah. about. <laughs> I can't, I so just, I'm glad. Yeah. That, that, that idea though. So that's why it's like, yeah, that would be a good part for a military wife to possibly read. Well, and also I, I do want to say, you know, that one surprise has been a lot of, wives reaching out to me or people who their spouses have retired and they've been out for a little bit and they said they were kind of scared to read it because they didn't want to go there. Yeah. It felt like it would be painful and they said it was, it felt like a hug. It felt comforting in a way they didn't expect. So it's funny. I'm, I'm joking when I say it would it be a good gift, <laughs> but, this, uh, but I thought, you know, I was sort of surprised, happily surprised mm -hmm. to hear that. And um, yeah, I mean, you're saying, what would my advice be to advice to a military an incoming spouse, military, incoming spouse? military spouse? I mean, and actually, that happens to you, doesn't it? Wouldn't it now? I mean, in Tacoma, there's still new Absolutely. people coming in. Yeah, I think that you know, one wife who's in the book, she reached out to me after reading it recently, and she said, "I'm so mad we weren't closer because <laughs> I feel like everything you wrote were." experience I was experiences I was having but I was I was so I felt so out of my depth I felt so afraid to look dumb in this new world that I didn't understand and so I self-isolated and stayed in my house and so she's you know she's a side character okay. but um I was and she so, recognized herself you told me you changed the word I mean it says in the book she's you changed the names she's, <laughs> she's a dancer she's recognizable right. um <laughs> but you know you can you can recognize yourself usually at the end of the day yeah she said I was shocked I was in it and um <laughs> But she, I think it would be to realize that because we are all going through the same experience, and I think this extends to the, vet, to the human experience, like we are all going through life's challenges that we cannot go through alone, um, that we cannot navigate alone. And so invite that person over for dinner, mm -hmm. go out to coffee. It might be awkward. It might be terrible. You might agree on almost nothing and yet that person might become your good friend yeah you know that person might be there like after you give birth or in the emergency room when you get into a car accident yeah. that person might literally save your life and so i think it's like be open to human connection mm -hmm. um even if it seems challenging or inconvenient or wildly difficult in a, especially in a time in which we are so polarized uh, aunties always loves it when I write, I ask this last question. It's like, what books are you reading? What's on your to be read, <laughs> read pile? Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, what stuff do you, do you have, I mean, you're on book tour right now, so. I have so many books yeah. on my nightstand. It's a problem. I am <laughs> reading a few at one time. I'm reading Come and Get It by Kylie Reed, which I am loving. Have you heard of this? No. It was a big, it was a big book a couple months ago. Uh, okay. Nope. Okay. I'll get on it. It's, you should get on it. And then I'm also reading um, a memoir from over a decade ago called Jesus Land by Julia Shears. Yeah, I just started it, and I'm reading it because I'm in conversation with her in the Bay Area. It's incredible. And it's about her family. Her um, mom is kind of a would-be Christian missionary, or she wish she had been, but Mr. Calling. And they decide to adopt... Um, 
two black boys and they moved to basically, I think I think the dad's a minister. I'm truly at the beginning. But they moved to rural Indiana. It was only and, a 33 minute flight. So you didn't yeah, have time. To I'm not far. <laughs> but they did and deal with incredible racism. And also the parents are, they deal kind of with the parents' racism because they want, they didn't want to adopt black boys, but they did because no one wanted them. And they were like, well, this is kind of our, the, burden we're taking on for God. Oh. But she was afraid the first she didn't want to touch the baby at first because she was afraid that it would rub off on her on her skin. Wow. You know? So it's about racism within the own, own okay. their own family yeah. and then also in rural Midwest. And um I, I just started but the writing is incredible. Cool. Yeah. It's really it's really good. Well uh Simone as they say Thank you for your service, <laughs> is Thanks. true. And we are now going to open it up to questions from the audience. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you for your service. This oh, please. The series I, is incredible. This, I, I have a great time. I love this job. <laughs> <laughs> questions from the audience. Anybody? Don? Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. I think, I think you answered this, but I was curious if you had to change names in the story to protect the innocent. Yeah, I I changed names. I changed physical appearances to the extent that I was comfortable with. I didn't change ethnic backgrounds, but you know, I might shorten someone's hair, eye color, or stature a little bit, that kind of thing. And yeah, and names. Are you working on something else after you're done with your book tour? Do you have another idea for, I mean, you're, you can I have the have second a, part of your memoir. I mean, gosh, 39. No, no. <laughs> I hope to never write about myself again. I guess maybe don't quote me on that. Even, okay. though, even though the internet is eternal, but I, um, I have a novel percolating. I used to write fiction way back in the day and then ended up in journalism and, and nonfiction writing. And, I'm returning to my fiction roots. That's my plan. Ooh. Yes. I'm very excited. Uh, this actually just occurred to me. Uh, what did your husband think when he read the book? He read four drafts of the book. Four? Yeah, <laughs> four. Which mean, and that, I know, that means there were even more than that. The best writing is, is rewriting. Uh, yeah, Come on, that's, yes, cra oh, that's craft talking. Yeah. <laughs> He read four drafts, which was not, I don't think we anticipated it to be that many, but um, he's a tough critic. And it was kind of incredible. I mean, I was very nervous when I gave him the first draft. He And he would read it next to me in bed. And I'd be like, you need to get out. I'd like, you, need, you might need to go rent a hotel room. Like, because I, every time he'd make a marking, I'd be like, what, is, what are you doing there? What's, what's that? And... Um, and then, you know, we sat at the kitchen table and spent hours and hours talking about the book. And it was incredibly helpful because he I he helped me not get things wrong, just basic mm -hmm. facts. Because it's I think one of the most challenging aspects of writing this book was the world building. Um, it is a world that exists, so it's not like world building in necessarily a fantasy novel, but you are building a world that a lot of your readers don't know anything about. Yeah. And it's yeah. a complicated world with a complicated social hierarchy and a complicated history. And so he, he helped me with that. Um, he was also just a really good craft editor. I never wanted to believe he was right, but he was almost always right. He'd be like, you, you, oh, Great, you I'm gonna pull down, that like, one out and send melodramatic. that. Melodramatic, <laughs> and I'd be like, God damn, but he was always right. Um, <laughs> and really, I mean, the main thing that was kind of incredible about the experience was not only, you know, because our role is to be silent and because when they are gone, they're so often profoundly compartmentalized and there's so much they can't tell us, even afterwards, um, that's pretty hard in a marriage. And I think any marriage is to, you know, it's a union of two lives. And even if you're together every day in a daily way, you're having different experiences of the same life that you're building together. So I think there can be moments in any marriage where it's like, do you do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you do you know what the last 15 years have been like for me? And it was like I got to kind of hand that to him and say, this is what it's been like. And he got to tell me things that he'd never really articulated about why he joined, about how it felt to be in now. And I think it felt I just feel like we got to know each other again. Yeah. And that was really beautiful. That was like a beautiful a gift. surprise. Yeah, that is a lovely gift. And that's been the amazing gift of really writing a memoir in general is like 
reconnecting with people who are in the book because I would interview them and talk to them. And I feel like I've our relationships have deepened. And even with my my mother, who I wrote about in not always sterling ways, and that was challenging, but it's it's deepened my relationship with her to to do that. So it's sort of like sometimes I have these moments of, oh my God, what have I done? Yeah. You know, it's so vulnerable. And then, but usually the truth will set you free. <laughs> I mean, but usually it will. Yeah. Uh, question over here. There we go. Thanks for your hand. See in your hand. Hi. So I've got several several questions. I'll start with one and let somebody else talk. But um, so you had said that you had just now said that you know that talking about why your husband entered was something that you're in just after the book talking about. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if in the beginning of your the story, if um, if you were against the concept and he was so determined, was his reasoning something that moved you in any direction? I, he is very logical, so he would kind of logic everything out in a way that was different to how my brain worked, but it was educational for me because his thinking was, we were no longer engaged in Iraq, which he was opposed to, but he did see the reason to be in Afghanistan, despite also acknowledging that the Taliban was not an existential threat to the United States. But he also felt like, and still feels, that countries need armies, armies need soldiers, and certain people are more fit and built to be soldiers than others. Mm -hmm. And he felt like he was one of those people. And so he felt he went through a whole, because he really, he was raised um, in part Zen Buddhist, and he, wow. he very serious about martial arts and had learned you only do harm, you know, in, in, with self-defense. You don't go out and do harm in any other way. And so I think that was very hard for him morally and ethically, and but it wasn't something he talked about a lot at the time, but he spent years thinking about it, and I think he would have joined much earlier had he not spent those years but ultimately he thought it's the moral thing to do because I do think armies need soldiers and and I am somebody who's built to be one how much of what you just said was what you learned recently and how much was what you contended with early he made that argument earlier like before he joined but I not sh I'm not sure that I heard it to the extent that I hear it now, if that makes any sense. Like, perhaps, I think I was a closed off, I think I was a, a closed off person in a lot of ways, and I think I had so many biases, um, because I'd grown up in Marin County, which is this bubble in California, that, you know, it really was like, vote red equals bad, military equals bad, guns bad, it's all bad. You know, very, I mean, I feel like I was raised with that kind of very simplistic thinking. So it was very hard for me to even understand, but why do we, but why do we need a military? Which I know sounds, I mean, I feel like that sounds outlandish, but it was, that was the kind of thinking I grew up with. Um, I'm more open to hearing it now. I also think he was more open to talking about the moral and ethical quandary now, because I feel like we were kind of in, at loggerheads. So I would sort of make this argument of, but why would you want to do this? Like, why Why do you want to get your hands dirty, so to speak? Why would you, do you, do you want to be violent, essentially? Like, do you want to do violence? And so I think he was always kind of in a defensive mode. And now, because we're not in that situation, and we're able to talk more honestly, he's more, he was more able to share, yeah, that was a hard decision for me. And I was raised to, you know, do no harm, essentially. And he spent a long time also looking at pictures of injured vets who had lost all their limbs, which was like, you know, that was a real fear he had worse than losing his life. But I, I didn't know that. Like, he didn't share that. Some of the most vulnerable things I think he went through um, he didn't share until much, much later. Can I ask, any, can I ask another? No, you, no, you, you ask them, we'll go back. I was married to a Navy submariner. 
Um, so I was, and he was gone when the kids were born, well, one of them was born. Mm -hmm. Was your husband able to be there? For he was, kind of and things? that's a really fantastic thing about um, his unit is they will, they will fly them home most of the time if they can. They will find a way, are which they, is really unusual, yeah. and the conventional forces are not like that. So we, get, we do get support that a lot of the conventional forces don't get. My ex got a baby gram. <laughs> what was that? His, my ex got a baby gram saying his son a was baby born. Gram, yeah. You know, on a submarine way back when. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. And how long was your, is your, was it, how long is he gone at a time? Uh, it depends. Sometimes okay. it's four months. Sometimes it's two months. Sometimes it's six months. Sometimes right. it's five weeks. It really depends. Yeah. yeah. I know submarines, it's. It can be like eight months, right? Yeah, it could. But his was only three and a half months at a time. Yeah, usually that's what it is yeah. for my husband. But also things are changing right now. And so everything's really in flux, yeah. uh, as usual. Um, but it's not, again, that's sort of like a plus that we don't, our husbands are gone more often, but they um, are also, they're not gone as long. I hear about, I have friend a friend going through a year long deployment right now, and Ugh. she's national he's national guard and so he they have a five-year-old son and they've never been through a separation like this before and suddenly he's gone for close to a year wow and um i can barely imagine i can imagine as without children because when he we got married he was gone for a year of training but it was training <laughs> so it was safer and um I can't imagine with children. Yeah. It's so, so much changes. Yep. I mean, it's like you're getting to know a new child at that age. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I just got to see a friend of mine whose husband was another officer on the submarine. They were passing through on their way. And I hadn't seen him in 30 years. And that's just it. She was such a big support. Wow. In Charleston. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, no. You had your Rachel. You got to read this Thank book, Thank you Rachel. for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. And Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Um, have you had uh, any pushback about anything in particular that you've written about? <laughs> Not yet. Do you mean <laughs> from individuals or from the actual the army? Oh. Not yet. It's funny. I mean, it's it's only been out for a week, so <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I know where it first. It's up. definitely something my husband. My husband's been bracing for you know everyone to find out about. <laughs> <laughs> so his um what's funny is the officer wives have a book club that I was not aware of because I'm not an officer wife and they are reading the book. So we will see what they think. Um but here, so it's mostly a different community. However, the battalion commander's wife actually knew back in Georgia, which is there are no goodbyes in the army. You just all run into each other again. She's lovely and uh she's reading it right now and her husband's a battalion commander, which is hard to explain what that is, but he's the big, he's the head cheese. Yeah. And um, he came up to my husband and he was like, my wife is reading your wife's book right now. And, um, <laughs> he, and, then, and then Andrew's like, it was very nice, but it was very political. He just said, I think that's an, you know, an underrepresented topic that needs to be explored more. And I <laughs> hope the book does very well. You know. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> the New York Times, the L.A. Times featured on Good Morning America. Yeah, it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's out there now. It's out so there. I will inevitably get pushed back. And certainly, I mean, there will be there have already been. I mean, if you look on Goodreads, which I don't recommend. Um, <laughs> don't be reading it there. It's really interesting because some some military spouses read it and they're just like. This I feel like I'm reading about myself. This is uh, I mean this is incredible. And then other ones read it because the military is not a monolith, and mm -hmm. every it's it's a country unto itself. So everyone's experiences are different, and they're like this is inaccurate. None of you know none of this is true. Or and I also think um, more conservative readers are a lot more critical of the book, and I and I do really feel ultimately like my hope in writing this book that it it is for everyone. My hope is that. It conveys that our shared humanity ultimately outweighs our differences. But I also can't really change the the lens and the background I come from. And that's more palatable for some readers than other others. Well, again, uh, thank Oh, there's one more. Okay, in the back. 
There we go. It's Final so question. lovely to watch the sun setting while I'm talking. Now. Yes, you can. <laughs> All right, I'm back over here. I want to thank Christy. Look at what you did. You brought her this early. Oh, well, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're incredible. I, I was stalking her a yeah. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. As I will read the book, I don't really want to read the book, mm. but you're sure bringing up a lot of memories. Mm. From that time. Wow. I'm just thinking about how many people are going to be moved and touched by this because of a divorce, the divorce, or what they went through, or what their parents went through. Mm -hmm. So understanding, and thank you for being such a wise presenter to bring her to us. Wow. Oh, that's that's so sweet. You. Thank you. Uh, Simone will be here afterwards. Auntie's has her book. You can buy it. She will autograph it for you.